In the annals of true crime, certain cases stand out as chilling reminders of the depths of human depravity. The mere mention of an axe murder sends shivers down our spines, conjuring images of brutal violence and unspeakable horror. As darkness descends upon these pages, we delve into the haunting narratives of four axe murder cases that have left communities gripped with fear and investigators grappling for answers. Brace yourself for a journey into the heart of darkness, where the line between fact and nightmares becomes blurred, and the quest for justice intertwines with the macabre. So get ready, cause today we will be discussing four different homicide cases that involve the perpetrators using an axe. This video was created for educational purposes only. Case number one, Jason Sweeney. Jason Sweeney was a 16-year-old construction worker from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Sweeney worked for his father, who was a contractor, that ran his own contracting business. And on Friday, May the 30th of 2003, Sweeney would leave school early to go help his dad work on a new building project he had recently got a contract for. Sweeney was excited and in a hurry to get done with work that day because he had plans to go on a date with a girl he had recently met. She was a 15-year-old from the same neighborhood that went by the name of Justina Morley. Sweeney didn't know much about the girl due to them just meeting. And what he certainly didn't know about her was that she had also been sleeping with two other people from the neighborhood. One of the boys was a 16-year-old that went by the name of Edward Batzig. Batsig actually happened to be Sweeney's best friend since the fourth grade. The other boy was also a 16-year-old and he went by the name of Nicholas Koya, that also happened to be a friend of Sweeney's. Nicholas also had an older brother, who was 17, and went by the name of Dominic Koya, who was also friends with Sweeney. But it was later reported that the two brothers had severed the friendship with Sweeney, for unknown reasons, right before Sweeney's date with Justina on the 30th of May 2003. Sweeney finished his hard day of work with his father, but not before getting his paycheck. His father counted out the $500 he was paying his son and handed him the cash. Sweeney grabbed the cash and was on his way. He freshened up, and then he went off to meet his date. With the promise of sexual intercourse, Justina was able to lure the clueless 16-year-old to a place called The Trails, which was a wooded area near the Delaware River. Unbeknownst to Sweeney, Batsig and the Koya brothers were already in the wooded area waiting for the pair to show up. When the couple arrived at the designated spot, the teens began their heinous act of violence against the 16-year-old Sweeney. Sweeney's former best friend would be the one to inflict the first blows. Hitting Sweeney repeatedly in the head and face with a hatchet. That's when the brothers followed by also striking the defenseless 16-year-old with a hatchet and a hammer. Jason Sweeney would beg his friends for his life. He begged the trio to stop attacking him. But it was no use, the boys would continue the brutal and senseless act of violence. At one point during the attack, Sweeney would look up at Batsig and ask him, please stop I'm bleeding. After which Batsig struck him in the head again with the hatchet. The boys would go on striking the 16-year-old until his cries for help were silenced for good. They then finished their barbaric act of violence by picking up a large and heavy boulder and smashing it on Sweeney's head for good measure. Investigators would later state that the only bone not broken in the 16-year-old's face was his left cheekbone. After the senseless crime was finished, the four suspects stole the $500 that Sweeney had earned earlier that day working with his father. They then shared a group hug, split the cash, and fled the crime scene. They would later spend the money on some jewelry and a bunch of illicit drugs that included heroin, Xanax, and weed, and in Dominic's own words, partied beyond redemption. A friend of Dominic Koya's named Joshua Staub, age 18, said that the group of teenagers bragged about the crime they've committed, especially how they came up with the plan to use Justina Morley as the bait to lure their victim into the wooded area, and that they seemed happy about doing it. Staub would also tell investigators that Batsig told him he knew that Sweeney would have his paycheck on him the day of the crime, 
and that it would be easy money. During the trial, prosecutors would state that all four of the teens were drug addicts and that the motive for killing Sweeney was robbery to help support their drug addictions. But later, a forensic psychologist would come to the conclusion that the teen's motivation for committing such a heinous crime went beyond just robbery. That it likely stemmed from envy and resentments of Sweeney's somewhat of a successful and normal life. But even that may not be the whole motivation behind the brutal attack, and we may never know what the true motive was. Case number 2, Heim Weiss. Saturday, November the 1st, of 1986, Chai Weiss was sound asleep in his bed, inside his dorm room that was located on the third floor of his dormitory at the Yeshiva, located at 63 East Beach Street in Long Beach, New York. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with what a Yeshiva is, it is an Orthodox college or seminary for Jewish people. Weiss was one of only two students in the entire dormitory that had his own room, the rest had to share their dorm room with at least one other student. Weiss was last seen alive at approximately 12.45 a.m. Saturday morning by a study partner. So it's believed that on that fateful night, anywhere from 1.30 till 6 a.m. someone crept into the room while Weiss was sound asleep and delivered a brutal attack. Investigators would later state that the cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. Investigators would state that someone had struck Weiss in the head with what was believed to be an axe or hatchet. It is believed he was struck two to three times to his face and head. Detectives said that Weiss was hit in the head with so much force that his skull was completely crushed. After the brutal attack was over, the attacker had moved Weiss's body off of his bed onto his dorm room floor. Investigators also mentioned that after the attack took place, the attacker then opened up the dorm room window. The window was found open even though the temperature on the night of the crime was in the 40s. Also Weiss was taking antibiotics for a sore throat making it unlikely that he would have opened it. The body was found on the floor, with the feet propped on the bed. Detectives concluded that the body was in the bed for several hours after the attack. The open window, according to investigators may have been due to a Jewish custom to allow the deceased soul to depart from the dorm room. Even though the theory that the open window may have been in an attempt to lessen the smell of a decomposing body if his remains weren't discovered immediately. The only piece of evidence found at the crime scene had been one single strand of hair. But investigators did not want to run a DNA test on the sample until they at least had a suspect to compare it to, out of fears of ruining the only piece of DNA evidence they collected from the scene. The only piece of evidence found at the crime scene had been one single strand of hair. But investigators did not want to run a DNA test on the sample until they at least had a suspect to compare it to, out of fears of ruining the only piece of DNA evidence they collected from the scene. The case was reopened in 2013, and the Nassau police increased the reward money to $25,000 for any information leading to an arrest. Then in 2017, Weiss's father did an interview about his son's case with PX11. After the interview, allegedly another former student from the yeshiva came forward stating that he was allegedly abused a whole decade before the horrific homicide. And they also reported on an alleged hanging that supposedly took place in the dorm shower room several years before the homicide. The Weiss case remains unsolved to this very day. Case number 3, The Axe Man of New Orleans. The Axe Man of New Orleans was a serial killer that once was active in New Orleans, Louisiana, and surrounding communities, including Gretna, from May 1918 to October. 1919. Press reports during the height of public panic about the killings mentioned similar murders as early as 1911, but, recent researchers have called these reports into question. Cause the axeman was never identified, and the murders remain unsolved. The killer is known mostly by his weapon of choice, like the name implies, because the victims were usually attacked with an axe, which often belonged to the victims themselves. In most cases, a panel on a back door of a home would be removed by a chisel. 
which along with the panel was left on the floor somewhere by the door. The intruder would then proceed to attack one or more of the residents with an axe, or in some cases, a straight razor. The crimes were not motivated by robbery, and the perpetrator never stole any items from his victims' homes. Joseph Maggio, an Italian grocer, and his wife Catherine were the first two victims of the axe man. They were attacked on May the 23rd of 1918 while sleeping next to each other in bed at their home on the corner of Upperline and Magnolia Streets, where they conducted a barroom and grocery. The killer broke into the home and then proceeded to cut the couple's throats with a straight razor. Upon leaving he bashed their heads with an axe, probably to conceal the real cause of death. Joseph survived the attack, but would die just minutes after being discovered by his brothers Jake and Andrew. The next victims would be Louis Bissumer and his mistress Harriet Lowe, who were attacked in the early morning hours of June the 27th of 1918, in the quarters, located at the corner of Dorgenois and La Harpe Streets. Bissumer was hit with a hatchet above his right temple, which resulted in a skull fracture. Lowe was struck over the left ear, and found unconscious when detectives arrived on the gory scene. The couple was discovered shortly after 7 a.m. on the morning of the attack by John Zanka, a driver of a bakery wagon who had come to make a routine delivery. Zanka found both Bissumer and Lowe laying in their own blood, both bleeding from their heads. The axe, which had belonged to Bissumer himself, was found in the bathroom of the apartment. Bissumer later stated to police that he had been sleeping when he was struck with the axe. Shortly after the attempted murder, Lowe stated that she remembered having been attacked by a mixed-race man, half black and white, yet her statement would be discounted by investigators due to her disillusioned state. Robbery was said to be the only possible explanation for the attacks, yet no money or valuables were taken or reported missing from the couple's home. Then, in the early evening hours of August 5, 1918, the eight months pregnant, 28-year-old Anna Schneider, of Elmira Street awoke to find a dark figure standing over her and was struck in the face repeatedly by a blunt object. Her scalp had been sliced open, and her face was completely covered in blood. Mrs. Schneider was discovered after midnight by her husband, Ed Schneider, who had gotten home late from work that fateful night. Schneider stated she couldn't remember anything about the attack, and gave birth to a healthy baby girl two days after she had been attacked in her bed. Her husband told investigators that nothing was taken from the home, besides $7 from his own wallet. Investigators believe she was attacked with a lamp from her bedside table. Pauline and Mary Bruno were sisters that were living with their elderly uncle Joseph Romano, when on August the 10th of 1918, Pauline and Mary awoke to a sound that startled them coming from the adjoining room where their uncle stayed. After entering the room, the sisters discovered that their uncle had been struck in his head, which resulted in two open wounds. The assailant was fleeing the scene of the crime as they arrived, yet the girls were able to distinguish that he was an African-American stocky man, who wore a dark suit and slouched hat. Romano, although he had serious injuries to his head, he was able to walk to the ambulance once it showed up to the scene, but he would tragically die two days later due to severe head trauma. The home had been ransacked, yet no items were stolen from Romano. Authorities found a bloody axe in the backyard and discovered that a panel on the back door had been chiseled away which is how the killer gained access to the home. After Joseph Romano's murder, it would be followed up by six more slayings from the axemen in this order. Mike Pepitone, Sarah Lawman, Steve Boca, Mary Cordomiglia, Rosie Cordomiglia, and Charles Cordomiglia. In most cases, the Axman's victims were Italian immigrants or Italian Americans, leading many to think that the slayings were racially motivated. Many newspaper outlets sensationalized this aspect of the crimes, even suggesting that the Mafia may have been involved despite lack of evidence. Some crime analysts have stated that the killings were related to sex, and that the murderer was perhaps a sadist specifically seeking out female victims. 
Criminologists Colin and Damon Wilson hypothesized that the Axemen killed male victims only when they got in the way of his attempts to murder women, which was supported by cases in which the woman of the household was murdered, but the man was not. A less plausible theory is that the killer committed the murders in an attempt to promote jazz music, suggested by a letter attributed to the killer in which he stated that he would spare the lives of those who played jazz in their homes. I'll read the letter now. It goes as follows. Hell, March 13, 1919. Esteemed mortal, they have never caught me and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible, even as the ether that surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orleanians and your foolish police call the Axemen. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know whom they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe, besmeared with blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. If you wish, you may tell the police to be careful not to rile me. Of course, I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at the way they have conducted their investigations in the past. In fact, they have been so utterly stupid as to not only amuse me, but his satanic majesty, Francis Joseph, etc. But tell them to beware. Let them not try to discover what I am, for it were better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the axe man. I don't think there is any need of such a warning, for I feel sure the police will always dodge me, as they have in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. Undoubtedly, you Orleanians think of me as a most horrible murderer, which I am, but I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, for I am in close relationship with the Angel of Death. Now, to be exact, at 12.15, earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I am going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I am going to make a little proposition to you people, and here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well then, so much the better for you people. One thing is certain and that is that some of your people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus, and it is about time I leave your earthly home, I will cease my discourse. Hoping that thou wilt publish this, that it may go well with thee, I have been, am and will be the worst spirit that ever existed either in fact or realm of fantasy. Signed off as, The Axe Man. The Axe Man was never caught or identified, and his crime spree stopped as fast as it began. The murderer's identity still remains unknown. On March 13, 1919, a letter purporting to be from The Axe Man was published in newspapers, saying that he would kill again at 15 minutes past midnight on the night of March 19, but would spare the occupants of any place where a jazz band was playing. That night all of New Orleans dance halls were filled over their capacities, and professional and amateur bands played jazz at parties at hundreds of houses around town. And it seemed to really work, because there happened to be no murders that night. Case Number 4, The Villisca Axe Murders In the annals of American crime history, certain cases stand out as particularly chilling, leaving a lasting impact on communities and capturing the collective imagination of the nation. One such case is the Villisca Axe Murders, a gruesome event that unfolded in the quiet town of Villisca, Iowa, over a century ago. To this day, the mystery remains unsolved, shrouded in darkness and haunting unanswered questions. On the fateful evening of June 9, 1912, the Moore family and two young house guests met a tragic end in their home at 508 East 2nd Street. Josiah Beath Moore, his wife Sarah, their four children, and the two girls visiting for a sleepover were brutally bludgeoned to death with an axe while they slept. 
The scene was one of sheer horror, as the unsuspecting victims were struck repeatedly, their lives abruptly cut short. News of the Velisca Axe murders spread like wildfire, shocking the tight-knit community and sending shockwaves throughout the nation. Authorities, including the Iowa State Bureau of Criminal Investigation, were called in to investigate the gruesome crime. The murder weapon, a bloodied axe found at the scene, became a chilling symbol of the heinous act. Despite extensive efforts, the case soon turned into a baffling enigma, leaving Velisca in a perpetual state of fear and unease. Following the Velisca Axe murders, an extensive investigation was conducted by local authorities and state investigators. The crime scene was meticulously examined, and evidence was collected, including fingerprints and bloodstains. However, this was a time before advanced forensic technology, and the limited tools available certainly hindered the investigative process greatly. And over the years, numerous suspects have been named and investigated in connection with the Velisca Axe murders. Suspicion initially fell on Frank F. Jones, a prominent local businessman, due to a long-standing feud with Josiah Moore. However, after two trials that ended in acquittals, Jones was never convicted. Other theories emerged, implicating transient workers, a serial killer, or even a local reverend who suffered from mental illness. Yet, no conclusive evidence has ever emerged to definitively solve the case. Evidence collected at the scene of the Velisca Axe murders played a crucial role in the investigation, providing insights into the nature of the crime and potential leads. Some of the key pieces of evidence included the murder weapon, which was an axe, was found at the crime scene. It was a common household tool, belonging to the Moore family. The axe had been used with such force that the blade was embedded in the victim's skulls. The handle, which was found in the basement, had been wiped clean of fingerprints. Several peculiar details emerged during the investigation. For instance, all the victims were found with their faces covered with clothing, as if to shield their eyes from the horror unfolding before them. It appeared that the killer had gone to great lengths to ensure that no one witnessed the massacre. Another unsettling discovery was a series of strange messages written in pencil on the walls of the house. The messages included phrases like, Still not dead, and I will kill again. These cryptic messages added an eerie element to the crime scene but ultimately provided no definitive leads. As for the investigators' theories regarding the events leading up to and on the day of the crime, several possibilities were considered. Like some investigators believed that the Velisca Axe murders were premeditated. They theorized that the killer had planned the attack in advance, possibly targeting the Moore family due to a personal vendetta or financial motives. Also, given the brutality of the crime and its similarity to other unsolved cases in the Midwest during that time, some investigators speculated that a serial killer may have been responsible. The transient nature of the crime scene suggested that the perpetrator may have entered the town unnoticed and left shortly after the murders. And then, another theory proposed that the Velisca Axe murders could have been a copycat crime, inspired by the infamous Axe Man of New Orleans, who had committed a series of Axe murders in 1918, that we spoke about earlier in this video. This theory suggested that the Velisca killer sought to emulate the notoriety of the Axe Man. But, some investigators leaned towards the belief that the perpetrator was a local resident, familiar with the town and its inhabitants. This theory centered around the idea that the killer knew the layout of the Moore house and the sleeping arrangements of the family, facilitating a swift and targeted attack. Ultimately, despite numerous speculations and investigative efforts, no conclusive theory emerged that could definitively explain the motive or identity of the Velisca Axe murderer. The case remains one of the most perplexing and enduring mysteries in American criminal history. The Velisca Axe murders had a profound and long-lasting impact on the small town of Velisca. The sense of safety and trust within the community was shattered, leaving residents fearful and forever changed. 
In the years that followed, stories of paranormal activity and hauntings emerged, further fueling the town's notoriety. The Moore House, the site of the murders, became a macabre tourist attraction, drawing visitors seeking a glimpse into the town's dark past. More than a century later, the Velisca Axe murders continue to captivate true crime enthusiasts and amateur sleuths alike. The case remains one of the most enduring unsolved mysteries in American history, with countless theories and speculations circulating to this day. Despite the passage of time, the truth behind the brutal slayings eludes us, leaving unanswered questions and a sense of injustice that lingers. The Velisca Axe murders stand as a chilling reminder of the evil that can strike even the most idyllic of places. The unsolved mystery has left a lasting scar on the town of Velisca, forever etching it into the annals of true crime lore. As the years pass, the hope of closure may dwindle, but the memory of that fateful night in June 1912 will forever haunt those who delve into the dark history of this small Iowa town. Well, there you have it. That's four cases involving killers that used an axe as their weapon of choice. Three of the four cases remain unsolved to this very day, and don't seem like they will be solved anytime soon. It's cases like these, shrouded in mystery, that make them worth talking about in the true crime community even decades later. Well that's all for this one. So until next time. Case closed.